you find me today in perhaps my favourite jumper. And with my laptop sitting on my lap, as a good laptop should, I'm about to take a look at the results I got of the gene testing done by the company 23andMe. Now, this is a sponsored video, and there was a previous sponsored video, which you can find a link to in the description, uh, in which I talked about genetic testing in general, and you saw me do what has to be done to get tested in this way. Essentially, you spit into a pot and post it off, and uh, then they put their results online. Some viewers have been asking why this video has taken so long to come out. Could it be because I had discovered that my ancestors were French? Well, no spoilers yet, but I will explain that there was quite a bit of back and forth with the boffins at 23andMe as they suggested ways to hone this video and by so doing improve the educational experience of my viewers. Each time we come to one of their contributions, you'll hear this sound. Right, let's go! Carrier status. This is whether I am a carrier of genes for certain things. Generally it's uh, diseases and things that you wouldn't want to have. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to put a graphic uh, over here so that you can see what I'm looking at. It's, um, I'm not going to try to do a screen capture because uh, that's far too irritating to watch. And besides, screen, screen capturing software never works properly. Okay, I've got a list of all sorts of things, Bloom syndrome and Canavan disease and cystic fibrosis and so forth. And I've got variant not detected, variant not detected, variant not detected, variant not detected, all the way down. It's a long list. Variant not detected. Come on, mouse, work properly. Variant not detected for every single one, all the way down to Zellweger syndrome spectrum PEX1 related. OK, well, that's good news, I suppose, um, because you wouldn't want any of these conditions. They're, they're not pleasant. Um, there are, of course, many, many conditions of this sort. And this, is, uh, this doesn't mean that I won't get any sort of condition in the future, because there are an awful lot of other things they've not tested for. And don't forget that this is carrier status. So, carrier status uh, means that you're a carrier of uh, some, some variant which might lead to this condition, uh, but you yourself perhaps are not actually suffering from that condition. So you, they're all recessives. Um, so even if, even if I'd got a, one of these being detected, um, I really wouldn't, that really wouldn't alter my behaviour very much because um, you might be thinking, oh, I wouldn't want to find out that, I, that I'm a carrier because you know, then I would, I, would, I would think, should I have children? Should I have a child? Yeah, you should have children because only if uh, your breeding partner, um, I'm going to use the word wife, uh, spouse perhaps, uh, because it's quicker, um, only if your spouse has that same, I'm going to use the word defective, which I know some people will go, oh, you can't say that, but with these conditions, really, you don't want these conditions. So defective gene, only if they have exactly that same variant on that same uh, locus, um, is there any chance of any child of yours actually having this condition? And it's really unlikely. But even if you you did have a spouse with the matching uh, the matching recessive, even then, uh, assuming that they're not to suffer from the condition themselves, only one in four of your children uh, will inherit both defective copies. Late onset Alzheimer's disease. Open report. Now here. I have some anxiety in that I did have grandparents who um, got uh, some, uh, some Alzheimer's symptoms before they died. There's a load of warnings there, which I've just seen, which are saying, don't worry, if this doesn't sound good, don't worry, it's not, it's not the be all and end all. Okay, I have got one copy of the E4 variant, which means I have a slightly increased risk of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease. Lifestyle, environment and other factors. Uh, can also affect your risk. Um, Later, by clicking a few clicks deeper into the site, I did find these figures. So you can see that at age 75, it goes from 3% for the general population to 4 to 7%, and at age 85, it roughly doubles. So, yeah. OK, well, I, I'm not terribly surprised, given that, as I say, at least two of my grandparents went a little bit doolally before they popped their clogs. Traits. Let's go to traits. Um, OK, according to this, I am likely to have little upper back hair. Correct! Uh, bald spot. Likely no bald spot. Wrong. Oh, drat. Hang on, let's click on the more detail for that one. Um, according to this, I'm unlikely to have a bald... 67% of people with my genes do not have a bald spot, but 33% do. So there you go. Um, uh, I, just, I just threw some unlucky dice there. And, uh, and got a bald spot. Although actually, 
bald spots do correlate with a lot of not tremendously good things, um, particularly if you go bald from the, the, the crown, as I'm going. Um, uh, you have, uh, for instance, a higher chance of uh, heart failure and uh, so forth. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, so it's not just the actual bald spot itself. Oh, oh Lord, I am afflicted by a bald spot. Uh, I'm likely not to be able to taste certain bitter tastes. Yep, I already knew about that one. Um, likely I have no cheek dimples. Uh, I likely have no cleft chin. Well, none of us knows. None of us knows. Um, I likely have detached earlobes. Correct! Well done. Uh, early hair loss. Likely no hair loss. Mm, yes, earwax type. Likely wet earwax. To be honest, I've never compared my earwax with anyone else's earwax, so I couldn't tell you just how dry or, wa or, or wet my earwax is. Um, as far as I know, it's uh, normal. Um, eye colour. Likely blue or green eyes. Now, isn't that interesting? You would think, wouldn't you, that they'd be able to tell me what colour my eyes are. Um, but they reckon that people with my genes are 52% likely to have blue eyes, 21% likely to have greenish blue eyes, 17% like, likely, pardon me, to have green eyes, 8% likely to have hazel eyes, 2% to have dark hazel eyes, and less than 1% light brown and less than 1% dark brown eyes. So uh, they can't even, from my genes, tell me my eye colour. They can only tell you, tell me a probability. And this this is perhaps a, a good indication of how the gene 4 is so often rubbish. When you see on a, a newspaper report, they found the gene 4 X, Y, Z. Well, actually, what we find is a load of A, T, C, G, A, 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 T, T, G, C, A, T, T, G, just a load of gobbledygook. And we've no idea how it has the effects it does. We don't actually, we're not able to read the Gattaca, if you like. Um, I like to call it Gattaca, that's not actually the proper thing. There's a film, which is actually rather good, called Gattaca. Um, and I think that's a really good word for the language of the genes. It's made up, of course, of G's, A's, T's and C's. But you notice that. Um, anyway, uh, we can't actually read it. Uh, we just have to look at patterns in it and, and make guesses. And um, I am 52% likely, that's really only just more than half, likely to have blue eyes. So that's how certain they are that I've got uh, blue eyes. My eyes are actually perhaps grey or grey-blue. Um, interestingly, if you look at historic documents, uh, it, people's eye colours recorded in the Victorian period, um, grey is really, really common. Um, I'm pretty sure that those people who were recorded as having grey eyes then would be recorded today as having blue eyes. Um, so, uh, likely, uh, likely that my ring finger is longer. Uh, well, I can make it longer like that, or I can make it shorter like that. I'd say it's about actually the, the same length. Um, likely little freckling, yep. Uh, my hair is likely straight or wavy. Well, that was informative. Um, my hair is likely light. Well, I was dazzling blonde when I was born, uh, but it's uh, been going uh, darker throughout my life, although I've still got a moderate amount of blonde in my beard. Um, photo, photic sneeze reflex. They're very proud of their photic sneeze reflex because that's actually something that 23andMe themselves discovered. They, they found the gene associated with people who have it. Um, in other words, if you go from a dark room into bright sun, do you sneeze? Uh, no, and yeah, I don't. Um, red hair. I probably am not a redhead. Well done. Skin pigmentation. Lightly light. Yeah. Sweet versus salty. I probably prefer salty. Yeah. Um, toe length ratio. Likely second toe longer. Correct. Um, Unibrow, likely no unibrow. Correct! Um, widow's Peak, likely likely no Widow's Peak. Ah, now I used to have one uh, when my, my hairline was down here when I was at university, but I've, I've lost it since. So does that mean I do or I don't have a Widow's Peak? I don't know. Asparagus odour detection, likely can smell. Yeah, I think I can. Okay, so they got um, pretty much everything right there apart from the bald spot. Um, but um, it's interesting, isn't it, that... Uh, they they only had to they, they had to talk in such vague probabilities and uh, is any of this useful do you know uh, is any of that useful and I, I could tell more about myself by from looking in a mirror than than any of that but there you go um those are my traits wellness oh let's go to wellness okay i am predisposed to weigh about average yeah Lactose intolerance. I am likely tolerant. I am very definitely lactose tolerant. Hey, which is great. 
Um, and lact lactose tolerance is an interesting one because that's something that humans have evolved since the invention of farming. Um, the populations of the world uh, today that are lactose tolerant exist in those areas of the world where the cow was domesticated and there is a uh, a long, long history of uh, daring that goes right back to the Neolithic. So we've had time to evolve lactose tolerance as an adult. Um, similarly, the Chinese and people in the Far East, where the Neolithic Revolution was based on rice instead of on wheat, they've got intestines that are about one and a half times as long as European intestines because um, uh, it, rice is just so much more difficult to digest and get energy out of uh, than wheat. So uh, the, these, these post uh, farming adaptions I find uh, very interesting. Ancestry. We are delighted to be able to reassure you that there is an 89% chance that you are not French. Hmm. 89. That's quite high, isn't it? Though, no, I'd like it to be a bit higher. So, uh, what have we got here? Um, ancestry composition. I am 54.1% British and Irish. Um, only 54. I would have thought, I would have expected a little bit higher. Oh, wait a minute. Northwest European, however, 99.2%. 99.2% of which British and, British and Irish, 54.1%. German and <gasps> French, 14.9%. It's probably largely German, don't you think? Uh, Scandinavian, 13.5%. Now, I have, I know, uh, a Norwegian great-grandfather. He was dead before I was born. But my Norwegian great-grandfather was used by my father as an explanation for my height. You see, I'm considerably taller than anyone else in my family. And um, he said, ah, yes, of course, of course, that'll be because of your, your Norwegian uh, great-grandfather. Oh, yes, I can remember sitting, sitting uh, in front of the fire with him, and he'd be sitting there, and he would tell me all sorts of interesting stories about the old days. And I remember he used to wear this waistcoat with, with shiny bits uh, on, in, in the cloth above the pockets, because he was always putting things in his pockets and taking them out again, and, and the cloth went shiny. That was what I remember about him. And, oh, yes, he was a big guy. Yes, that's probably why you're so tall thing is that when my father's mother died and my father was going through her things, um, we, he found uh, my great-grandfather's Merchant Navy discharge papers. And it turns out that he was about five foot five. <laughs> he, was a, he was a short guy. So, um, yeah, that explanation doesn't really work. Um, broadly Northwestern European, 16.6%. Wow, that is a vague category, isn't it? Uh, broadly Southern European, 0.7%, and Southern European, as opposed to broadly Southern European, 0.7%, uh, and broadly European, 0.1%. Wow, You're, I'm 0.1% broadly European. That makes me feel so much more British. <laughs> um, with regard to how I'm going to live my life with regard to my health, I haven't uh, come across anything that suggests that I need to change things. I think if uh, my diet uh, did predispose me to get fat in combination with my genes, that by now surely I would have got a bit fat. And uh, as far as I know, I'm a reasonably healthy weight, so um, I'm not too worried there. Uh, as for my ancestry, um, yep, it picked up on, on, the, on Scandinavian, uh, but then do you know what we've if, if, you're, if you are pale-skinned like me, there is some Scandinavian in you. Um, and broadly Northwestern European is a really broad category. So that could be Dutch, Welsh, uh, Cornish, um, Jute, Angle, Frisian, the lot. Um, and French and German, what do they mean? I, what do they even mean by German? Because uh, if I've got Angle and Saxon and Jute and Frisian in me, uh, they are sort of... Danish, Dutch, Germans, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're from that part of the world in the Dark Ages. They migrated in the migration period, in the early medieval period, if that's what you want to prefer to call them. Uh, they came over to Britain. So, um, ha ha yes, what does that mean? See, race is a very strange thing because it definitely exists. We all know we recognise it. If I were to go to India and look about me, I would see people who look recognisably Indian and not like me, and they would all immediately look at me uh, well, they might eventually, some of them, look at me and recognise that I am not one of them. And yet, genetically, we're extremely similar. Um, and individuals vary more than races do. So if you were to uh, test 
uh, one Indian and uh, another randomly assigned Indian, they would be on average 12 times more different from each other than the average of all Indians and the average of all British. The groups do vary and they vary significantly such that we can recognize each other as different and yet individuals vary more. Race is in many ways skin deep um, but um, I would say that there is there is a sort of potential for if you like good racism because if I were to go to my doctor and say oh doctor I've got these symptoms this that and the other and he might think right okay we've got to it could be something serious we've got to diagnose this quickly I will go I will go to test for the things that are most likely first um, and that, that's the rational thing that you would want your doctor to do um, now he might look at uh, a patient and think oh now this patient is Indian and Indians are enormously more likely to suffer from kidney trouble uh, than other people in the population so even though with another person I would think it's probably more likely to be this I think we're going to we're going to test for kidney trouble first you want your doctor to be biased in, in, uh, in that way um, because you're more likely to get the right treatment and quickly so you know uh, when people go on about oh genetic testing it can lead to racism well yeah but that's a good form of racism isn't it if you take racism as meaning simply treating people differently according to their race that that would be a, a good useful and beneficial way for someone to treat you in a racist manner um uh, anyway so there you go uh, i know a lot of people uh, uh commented on my um I, I bet it turns out to be french but when you turn up the confidence level to 70 percent i see my french and german has now gone down to four percent let's whack it up to 90 percent uh 90 percent uh confidence level my oh with 90 percent confidence level french and german have now dropped off the screen and uh i am now 79.1 percent northwestern european <laughs> so there you go um it seems that uh i i can i can breathe easily you know i'm not french um Genetics is a very rapidly moving field um, and some of the some of the discoveries are so amazingly recent I mean, so much of we've only really known that DNA was responsible for 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 passing on human traits uh, since about the 1940s 1953 was when uh, the structure of DNA was actually finally arrived at and uh, then it was uh, about 1960 ish uh, that it was possible for us to sequence genes reasonably quickly the way it's done by the way is is I'll try and do a, a quick summary um, you you get a load of genes um, and you uh, break them all up randomly and then you get you put samples into four test tubes and then you put chemicals in the four test tubes this chemical will uh stick on the end of each broken strand of dna uh an end point if it ends in an a and this one will put on an end end point a terminus if you like if it ends in a c and then g and then a t c and g they're, they're the four letters the other one um and then give it a good shake probably and uh, then you stick it in some liquid with some thick gel and uh, an electrode now because the dna is slightly electrically charged it will be attracted to the electrode i can't remember if it's the positive or the ne negative doesn't matter through a layer of thick gel and the gel is just there to slow it down which has the effect that the the lightest the shortest little bits get there first so the very first um say this is the test tube for a the very first bits to get there will be the a bits and then later on you'll get the, uh, the 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 next longest the next longest the next longest and so you end up with all the a's in sequence and then you've got you do that for the four test tubes and you overlay all the results little smears and you get the full sequence the gattaca the a's the t's the c's and the g's i think that's tremendously clever it was a it was a british guy called uh, fred sanger who came up with that uh, he got the nobel prize for it and it opened the doors to a huge amount of genetic study now to, actually his methods um are not used so much now because uh, other uh cheaper faster methods have been uh, have been invented and i actually know the inventor of one of them well i don't know okay uh she's my friend-in-law in that a friend of mine married her um and uh, anyway um so now they've got they've got machines that are about the size of a pack of cards that you can take out into the countryside and and out in the wild you can sample uh, the dna of some plant they just plug into a usb port into a laptop it's crazy it's amazing um but it's still gobbledygook it's still gobbledygook what what you what we see 
is still a load of letters and we don't know why they mean what they mean. Yes, we worked out that they code for proteins, um, but so often you'll see in the press uh, a headline, they found the gene for blah, 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 something or other. And I'm sure a lot of geneticists go, no, that's not what's happened at all. Um, they've perhaps identified a gene which they seem to feel is in some way associated with something. For instance, there's one, uh, there's a gene that Neanderthals have, which is in humans and loads of other uh, creatures. And we have reason to believe that Neanderthals could speak because they had this, um, this gene which encodes for something in the brain to do with expressing yourself vocally. And one of the reasons we know this is because you can create things called knockout creatures, like a knockout mice, which is what is a mouse, which you've bred deliberately. It's like a normal mouse, except it doesn't have this gene. So you, you knock out that gene and then you look at the mouse and think, OK, so is it a normal mouse? And they don't squeak and songbirds don't sing. So it's something to do with expressing yourself vocally. Um, and um, but we're, we're scrabbling around in the dark. We don't act, we can't actually read the code. It's still gobbledygook to us. So there is another revolution ahead, perhaps, and I have no idea when this will happen, but sometime in the future, this is a bit sci-fi, but sometime in the future, uh, we will actually learn how this stuff has the effect that it does. And then, then we could, can you imagine what a huge leap in technology there will be? Because then you can code for things. You can say, okay, you want a table? Okay, right, so what do you want? You want a table, you want it to have the, the look, the colour of mahogany, but the, 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 dain, the, the, the grain pattern of walnut, okay, but the smell of pine, okay, right. And you want, you want a table, you want, what shape do you want the legs? Let's have a look. Ooh, funky, yeah, okay, how big do you want it? Right, and you want the whole table in one single solid piece. There are no joins anywhere. Okay, we'll just code for that. Okay, right, here's your seed. Plant that in your garden. And in 17 months, you will have that dining room table to be exactly uh, the, the, the size and shape that you want it. Uh, you could, we, we could start coding for something deliberately. Um, and one idea I had for a sci-fi novel, which I'll probably never get around to writing, but here's the idea, is that uh, it's in the far future and humans want to colonize other planets around the, the universe. Uh, but the trouble is that they haven't actually invented warp drive yet. So you still actually have to just get through physical space in the usual way. Um, and moving humans around is really difficult because they're really heavy and you, you can't uh, subject them to really high G forces. But what if you could just make a spaceship that's just this big, just like a shell, and fire it at an incredible uh, speed through space from some amazing gun, subjecting it to g-forces of 179 or whatever, which would kill a human stone dead, and it just carries with it the genetic information, the seeds, if you like, for the things you're going to need to colonize a planet when you get there. So, if you want uh, a space station, for instance, which might be necessary on some planet somewhere, um, rather than moving all the people and moving all the bits of metal and so forth to this planet and then laboriously bolting it together and making it airtight and doing all sorts of stuff, what you do is you just genetically code for a space station and then fire the seed into the planet and wait. <laughs> so by the time you get there, there's a naturally occurring, well, there's an unnaturally occurring space station that's grown. Um, and you know, perhaps in the future, that's, that's the way things will be done. You want to think, oh, I just code for it. We know that uh, nature can code for amazingly sophisticated things like human brains. Um, so in the future, we may be able to code for amazingly sophisticated things like naturally occurring space stations and spaceships. Um, anyway, um, got a little bit off, off the track here. Oh yeah, I, I, I remember that. I was talking about the gene for, and I got sidetracked twice. Um, so with the knockout genes, so imagine, imagine there is a world that you live in that's very similar to our world, except there are these things, they're driverless cars, but we don't know that. We don't know what they are or how they work or what they're for or why they spend so long being completely stationary and then suddenly moving and then oh, one's moving. Um, but we come up with ideas as to what might be going on. So we get loads and loads of people to make observations and they make scientific observations of these things because there's this idea that they only move around when those things, those round things, there are four of them, what should we call them? Uh, wheels. Is that a good name for them? Never mind, it'll do for now. Um, they only move around when those, when those wheels are turning and they never move around when those, uh, they never move around when those wheels are not turning. And similarly, when they're stationary, the wheels never turn. But 
Are we sure that's true? So they make loads and loads of observations, and yet, okay, there are a couple of you know, possibly false reports, but the overwhelming number of, uh, of observations made after a while are that, yeah, they only move when the wheels are turning, and they never move uh, when the meal, wheels are, are not turning. So, uh, okay, their movement is something to do with these wheels going around. But, but wait, what makes the wheels go around? Okay, well, what we can do is we can remove a bit of the car and see if it stops the wheels going round. So they remove a bit. They have no idea what they're removing, what it is or what it does, um, because they don't really understand this thing. So they just remove a bit at random. And then they sit back and watch. Is it going to move? Is it going to move? It's not moving. It's not moving. We've, we've removed the thing which... Oh, no, now it's moving. No, okay, it's moving now. All right, so clearly the thing we removed, which was the, the, the headrest of one of the seats, that doesn't make... Uh, the, the wheels go around. Okay, right, well, let's, let's knock out some genes uh, that code for some other part of this animal. Let's remove some other part of the car. Okay, so you remove another bit. And then, again, you watch, it's not moving. Ah, oh, it's moving. Okay, it's not that. It was the petrol cap. Never mind. Okay, so then, then you remove another bit. And then you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and it doesn't move. And think, is this a fluke result? Have we got a broken one? Okay, so you repeat the experiment. You remove these, this, this same bit from loads of others of these driverless cars, and they all never start moving. You wait for them to move and none of them ever starts. And after waiting a week and not, not a single one has moved, you think, yes, we have found the, something that is to do with the wheels going round. It looks like this, okay? So this has some connection, we don't know exactly what, um, with the wheels going round. Uh, but then it gets released to the press. And what, what do the press do? They publish a headline, yes, the, the bit of the car that makes the wheel go around, wheels go around, has been found, and it's miraculous. How does this, little, this, this thin thing with apparently no moving parts, let's call it a wire for want of a better uh, word, um, how does this make, it's a mystery, but it's the miracle of the driverless car. Who knows um, what miracles scientists will come up with next? <sighs> no. As you know, because you know a bit more about cars than, than the people in my notional example, this does not make the wheels go around. This is the wire that carries the electrical signal uh, from, the, from where you turn the, uh, the key in the ignition, uh, which then sends the electrical signal to the spark plug. But if you remove that, the electrical, signal, the electrical signal from the ignition never gets to the spark plug, so the engine never starts, never turns over, the wheels don't go around, it doesn't move. So there you go. So tell me, it, is this what makes the wheels in a car go round? Is this the gene for wheels on a car going round? No. But that's what people keep Get, get, getting misinformed uh, about by people who don't understand genetics and how genetics uh, is, is studied. We're scrambling around in the dark. We've got these letters, these A's, these T's, these G's, these C's. Nobody knows what the hell, how the hell this language really works. Um, and we don't know why these proteins have these amazing effects, but they do. Um, so uh, when we find something for this disease, for having a dimple in your chin, for whatever it is, it's just, oh, oh, we found this thing which is in some way associated with, with this thing, with this, this, this trait, this carrying this disease or whatever, and that's pretty much as far as we can get. But that said, genetics is an extremely fast-moving uh, and exciting field to be in. Um, and uh, for, for the archaeologist in me, I, of course, you know, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated when they come up with, with the DNA of people who have been long dead, and DNA can tell us some amazing things. Only in, in 2015 did we find, for instance, that uh, the uh, Denisovans, the, the people who uh, were found first in a, in, a, in a cave in Russia, which was previously lived in by a guy called Denis, hence they named the cave after him, and so they ended up naming the people after Denis, but he wasn't one, never mind. Um, this cave had been occupied for 230,000 years. Is that right? Where did I get that number? Is that, I hope that's right. Uh, I don't know where I got that number from. Uh, to tell you what, I'm going to check that fact, and if I am right, I'm going to put a gold star here, and um, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, so either hooray or do as appropriate. But anyway, uh, the cave had been occupied by uh, various um, hominids, uh, various human-like creatures and various animals uh, for, for a very long time, and they were able, just from one fingertip, just from one fingertip, was it a chimpanzee fingertip? Was it a human? Was it... They couldn't tell. It's just... It looks so similar in all those species. They couldn't tell by looking at the fingertip. But they got DNA out of it, and they, they, they found this, this new... Bit. You've heard of Neanderthals, right? Well, it's like another, another hominid, another type of human. And 
what is amazing still is they've actually found more amazing still is they found uh, ancestors of these people live, living today in, in Fiji and Papua New Guinea. There are people who are 5% uh, Denisovan. Uh, oh, that's a point. I didn't uh, see how, how Neanderthal I am, which I'll, I'll go and look at in a moment. Um, and so, so, wow. So we've discovered from a fingertip, from one fingertip, we've discovered a new group of, of, of new version of humanity and discovered ancestors uh, in the world today, um, uh, you know, which I, I find uh, utterly, utterly amazing. Oh, another thing uh, about Neanderthals. Um, you probably uh, have read loads of headlines about how Neanderthals and humans uh, crossed. That is to say that you know, people like me have got some Neanderthal genes in them. Well, um, one question which you might not think would be answerable actually is answerable by looking at the Neanderthal and sorry modern um, uh, genes of people because you might think this crossing over was it was it male humans and female Neanderthals or was it was it uh, male Neanderthals and female uh, humans or, or was it you know a, a, a random uh, admixture of the two um, well we can't tell whether it was rape or whether it was consensual or why exactly the, the crossings happened but we can say with quite a lot of confidence that it was almost always male Neanderthals mating with human females also known as women um, and we know this because you can look at the X chromosomes now the X chromosome is a very large chromosome it has a lot of information on it uh, but half the time uh, the father contributes nothing to it because he doesn't uh, contribute an X chromosome half the time. Half the time he contributes a Y chromosome. And the amount of Neanderthal genetic information on the X chromosome of modern humans is considerably lower than the amount found on other chromosomes. So there you go. It was male Neanderthals uh, mating with the human females. Now, to find out how Neanderthal I am, because, you know, uh, this is important. Um, how did I uh, skip that? Um, okay, it's not under ancestry composition for some reason. So let's go back uh, to reports and see if I can find it there. Because uh, you want to know this, don't we? We all want to know how, how uh, Neanderthal we are. It's Neanderthal, by the way, not Neanderthal. But, you know, if you say Neanderthal, don't be embarrassed. It's, um, here we go. Found it. Neanderthal ancestry. 292 Neanderthal um, variants um, and that is you have more Neanderthal variants than 72% of 23andMe customers however your Neanderthal ancestry accounts for less than 4% of your overall DNA that's really high that's amazingly high. That's way over average. You have one Neanderthal variant associated with a reduced tendency to sneeze after eating dark chocolate. Well, I don't sneeze after eating dark chocolate, so that fits. Um, I have no Neanderthal variants associated with having less back hair. Oh, suggesting that Neanderthals were possibly more bald on the back. We think of them as hairy, don't we? Um, you have naught Neanderthal variants associated with your height. Well, that's unsurprising because they were quite short. So um, how am I supposed to alter my uh, behaviour uh, in, in the light of this knowledge? Am I now going to seek out women with more or fewer Neanderthal genes? No, nah, I think actually the women I'm likely to be attracted to and mate with are probably the same women uh, that I would have ended up being attracted to without this knowledge. So um, my word, this video is getting quite long, isn't it? So. I think I'm going to wrap this up then. It seems that I am broadly sort of Northern European and, um, well, who'd have guessed? <laughs>